The Business Innovation Zone, also known as the Biz, is the place to start for entrepreneurs in Iowa. The Biz helps entrepreneurs and startup companies focus on idea development, business models, strategy, market validation, mentoring, and networking. We also help clients connect with qualified community and state resources needed to grow their business. Throughout the year, we provide a number of networking opportunities with experienced entrepreneurs and business leaders by offering monthly luncheons and all-day seminars on marketing and finance. You can learn more about the biz at bizci.org. I came today to talk a little bit about mobile, and uh, I'm going to kind of define for our purposes kind of what mobile is, um, some ways to be mobile, and um, some tips to get started. Um, this is kind of a high-level presentation, but um, as you have questions, please just you know shout them out towards me. I'll make sure I repeat them for the, the viewers at home or later. Um, so first, I want to tell, tell you a little bit about me and a little bit about BitMethod. So what BitMethod is, is we're really a product development shop for mobile. And we do it in two ways. We, we build products for ourselves, and we build products for others. I'm going to show you some of the things that we built for both ourselves and others. Um, and recently, we've undertaken a big project, a, a big product for ourselves, because um, that's where we ultimately want to be. We want to be a product um, company not necessarily in client services forever and ever. And this is me. Um, I'm the CEO of BitMethod. I come from the Virtual Reality Application Center at Iowa State. I spent five, six years there in the early 2000s. And uh, the great thing about working in VR at that time was I found out how to make the most complicated interfaces that you'd ever imagine. Um, because we were putting graphics on these six walls and people were coming in with glasses and they were getting sick. And, um, but we were, we were trying to make something useful. And uh, so that experience kind of showed me like the, the end of the spectrum I didn't want to be on. Um, and so, you know, I kind of, ever since then I've had an interest in making things simple, making things clear, making um, software that's really focused on the user. I actually get to work next to probably the smartest people I know. Um, this is my partner Igor. Um, he runs our like he basically makes the wheels go round at our company. Um, he's awesome. Um, Neil is our software engineer. The guy can code anybody that I know under the table. And finally, um, we've got a designer. Her name is Amanda Morrow, Morrow and. Uh, she is now kind of blossoming and becoming kind of the, I don't know, design queen of Des Moines, which is kind of awesome. Um, some of the things that we've worked on. One of the first apps we did was this little app called Lightweight. And uh, it's deceptively simple, right? Like you enter your weight and then it tells you, good job, like you can relax or like, come on, get with the program, you're gaining some weight. But then in the background, there's all this complicated math that's kind of um, figuring out whether you're actually gaining weight or you can relax or um, you're doing good and you can just kind of keep what you're doing um, going forward. Because one of the things that we found was as soon as you got into these weight apps, it was all about showing you these charts and you could kind of, I don't know, view it almost as, as like weight porn, right? Like it's just oh look, I, I'm down a half a pound a day, or I'm up a quarter of a pound today, like oh my gosh, what am I supposed to do? And uh, really, if you think about it from day to day, it doesn't matter. It's am I down a couple pounds over the last two weeks, or am I not? Uh, the, one of the next asks we did was called Eat Sleep. Um, I had a kid, and my wife went to the app store. She started downloading all of these uh, baby tracking apps. And uh, they were all coded by nerds, and we could tell it. And we could tell it because um, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. She's trying to feed um, our son, Charlie. And they're having her start timers and stop timers. And if she forgets, then like, it tells, tells her that she was feeding Charlie for like eight hours over, overnight, which is not the case. And so what we did was went back and looked, all right, how can we make this simpler? In, in a like, if we were to do statistical analysis, what actually matters? Um, 
doesn't matter that she fed Charlie for 11 minutes or that he had 4.2356 ounces. No, like four ounces is good because if you take those charts to a doctor, they just want to know kind of when that trend might have started, like this downward um, spiral of your child's health. And so um, this has been kind of one of our most, it's kind of like our silent success. Um, I think in the last quarter we shipped, I don't know, like 13 to 15,000 of these apps. It's free. Um, we did it just because we were getting into app development and wanted to try it out. So it's also uh, like our highest rated. I think it's like at a 4.5 um, out of 5 star rating, <coughs> even two years in, which is kind of insane. And moms write the nicest emails to me all the time. Like they will, they will go on for paragraphs how they love the app, and then they'll say like, but there's this little thing, and it's usually like a bug that's really our fault, and they could have just yelled at me and it would have fixed it. Um, but whatever. This, this was a breaking news we, app that we had done. Um, there's these guys that ran a Twitter account um, called App Breaking News, and uh, they had about a half million followers on Twitter. This was two and a half years ago, um, which was a lot back then. They were in the top, I don't know, 50 Twitter accounts. Um, online. And so what we did was we were kind of the first app to really go and take the, this concept of like pushing messages out to a phone like you do, you get every day now with like Foursquare, you know, Mark just checked in into the biz or, or Matthew's now at Startup City Des Moines. We were pushing out, you know, Yasser Arafat just stepped down, um, Walter Cronkite just died all these super breaking news and uh, they're super fast breaking news and then following the cycle from that so um, does anybody remember the that boy or the boy in the the balloon balloon boy it, the balloon boy start like story came out maybe two weeks after we launched the app and it was really amazing because um, we thought this was pretty cool and all the tech blogs in Silicon Valley thought this was pretty cool but I was out on the road and this balloon boy story hit. And, uh, and it was the first time where like something major had happened and I didn't feel this like need like pull towards the computer to go like, am I missing anything? Because I just want to sit here and see if the boy's okay. Instead they were, they were saying, you know, they're looking in the attic. Uh, you know, the balloon is over Colorado. Um, uh oh, it's starting to go down. And you're like, oh my gosh. Um, but this, it won a bunch of awards. The, the Twitter account went from a half a million followers to basically one and a half million followers. And uh, the guys that we partnered with for this decided to make a business to business newswire out of what they were doing. So um, we killed it. But it was awesome. Uh, recently we did Smarty Pigs uh, mobile apps. And that's really interesting because they came from this full site that could do all of these different things and came to us and said, like, will you build a mobile app? Like, we think we've got maybe five or six things that folks want to do all the time, um, but can you take a look at it and kind of make the best adaptation possible and figure out what people want on the go? And uh, I think when we were done with the very first version, the mock-ups were 50 or 60 screens. Um, and you go and you play with the app and you're like, wow, this, this app doesn't, it feels complete, but it's not that big, but it's, it was still 50 or 60 screens. Last year we did one for 8035. Um, and this was to, it's 8035 is a music festival. Anybody gone? Yeah, okay. Um, and this was really to kind of organize your schedule on the go. You could favorite bands and, and you could make your own little schedule and then it would kind of tell you, oh, you need to be at this end of, um, of Grand because the um, Christopher and the Conkers are playing or um, the headliner's going on or the headliner got moved back 15 minutes so you, you can stay where you're at. Um, this was our last project. Just a quick one for come and go. Um, they rolled out a new campaign with Warm and Fuzzy uh, that, and they wanted a mobile component for it. So what you did was you would submit, this is a background, and then like the come and go store is where you'd put your face at, and you could take all these fun pictures with, um, 
with the characters, and then you could basically unlock some coupons, right? Click here to f save five dollars or five cents per gallon on gas, and people loved it. It was uh, really well, really well received for um, a local app because you know eighty thirty five and and come and go are quite local versus like a Smarty Pig, which is national. They just got you know, mentioned on CNN the other day as one of the top. 50 ways to save money. So this gets into our talk. Why am I here? I hear a lot of, a lot of this um, when it comes to mobile. We wanna, we're going to go mobile, but we want to kind of do everything. Um, and it's funny because if you really think about it, when you're sitting around the table going like, yeah, let's go mobile. Everyone is thinking about this night, like, let's build that. This is what we're all wanting to build. We're going to build it, and it's going to be awesome. But when we build it, <laughs> Tom's magnifying glass got in, and, and Jim's uh, tweezers got in, and, uh, and Christian, he just, he just, he wanted everything. And since he was the boss, we did it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so we get really far away from what we, what we truly wanted to do because we forgot about the user along the way. We forgot about what the user want, wants. Can I go back? This is what the user wanted. They wanted the best knife ever, right? And that's what we wanted too. And then when we built it, we just, we built what everybody on the, in the table, or around the table um, wanted to build, not what we should have built. I also want to kind of just educate folks about um, some of the things not to do or some of the places you're not going to find a lot of value. Uh, maybe if you're a really famous brewery, you know, showing a little app that you can knock back a brewski, that might be cool. But if you're uh, a local grocery store, it's probably not going to be worth your time or effort. You're not going to get a whole lot of value out of it. It's going to be cool and kitschy maybe a little trendy, um, but nobody's going to care tomorrow. So I'm going to go through these kind of sections in my talk. I'm going to get into defining mobile, um, trying to show you what this value that I talked about means, what users mean, um, some ways of being mobile, and uh, how to get started. For me, this is what mobile is. It's utility contextualized. Um, if you were to think about a clock, right? If you can find a clock, there's no clocks in here. It's like Walmart. They just want you to stay here forever. Um, but if you think about a clock on the wall and, and somebody said like, gosh, I wish I could find a mobile version of that, that clock. They didn't just grab the clock off the wall and just walk around with the clock. They invented the watch, right? And the watch is not just the, the, that clock face, smaller, it's got like the perfect vehicle, right? Like your wrist, because you can just go, all right, it's 1215. Um, it may be completely obvious to us now, but you know, when Edison, not Edison, when Ford made the car, people still just wanted faster horses or whatever the um, saying was. And so mobile is really just finding that right context for some, some piece of utility for your business. So if we think about Foursquare, Foursquare is a little example that I've got. Um, when you go to check in, it's going to tell you who's the mayor here. It's going to show you some things, like you, the assumption with Foursquare, I'm at some place, I'm here maybe, and I'm going to check in and tell my friends that I'm here. So what's it going to tell me? It's going to tell me who the mayor is, um, this is going to be somebody that frequents that business often that I might get to know. Um, it's going to have tips from friends, and it's going to have some more information about the venue that I'm at as I'm checking in. That's kind of handy. Um, it's, not, it's not showing me pictures of the exterior of the building because I just walked into this place. I don't need to know that. There's all these different types of devices, all these different types of platforms, I'm going to kind of run through them real quick just so you guys have an understanding of them. First, what's a mobile device? 
They come in all shapes and sizes. You get the iPod, what is that, Nano? Nano? Yes. Yeah. That you run, you wear it on your beefy bicep while you run, and especially the pink version, um, so you can listen to music. You've got um, Nintendo DS, you've got a Kindle, like you can bring books where you want to go. Uh, you've got the iPad. How many people have iPads? That's a lot, right? And why do you, why, anybody, why do you bring your iPad around? Don't make me call on anybody. Mark? Utility. There you go. <coughs> so there's all these, all these utilities that are in this nice form factor to carry around and do amazing things with. What can these devices do? Right? They can deliver books to us, but they also have GPS on them. They can tell us where we're at. They've got instant, you know, they've got email that's instant. Um, Blackberry kind of really showed the, like, how useful email anywhere you were at in the world could be. Um, we've got SMS, of course, text messaging. Well, we've got a phone. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we just had a phone. That's all we had. We brought a phone around. Um, it couldn't, it couldn't tell us where we're at. Like, it could just call people, which was great. Like, if, you, if you're thinking a few years ago, like, that was awesome because you didn't have to have that box that sat in the middle of your car to make phone calls, or you didn't have to go and have the little uh, rotary dial phones and wait for the, you know, dial to get back to the top. <coughs> Made a cool click, but technology evolved. Uh, cameras, the number one camera in the United States right now as measured by Flickr, is iPhone, is the iPhone. That is the camera, that's the camera that's taking the most pictures in the world right now. We can do things like voice recognition. Of course, one of the big ones is that tactile feedback from being able to touch the actual um, device. We can, of course, store data. And we've, we now, the internet is kind of ubiquitous. It's everywhere. The internet's in our pocket. Um, and there's all kind of, bullet points on the side, but it's really huge because this stuff didn't exist like five years ago. Like you couldn't really do this five years ago. You could do maybe email, you could do SMS, but the internet in our, in our pocket and have it be useful, that's something new. That's why mobile is special. We've got these different platforms. And so anybody who's, who's got iOS, I do, right? Who's, who's running Android? Any BlackBerry? Windows 7? Crickets. Um, Palm OS? Nobody. You've got all of these different platforms, just kind of operating systems, kind of like Windows and Mac. You know, you've got these different platforms um, for your phones. And they're nothing more than um, an operating system that your apps and, and the internet and whatever runs on top of. So what's an app? When I say like, an app, it's, it's a native application developed for a specific um, platform. So Angry Birds um, on my iPhone, that's an app. Of course, now Angry Birds kind of runs everywhere, but Angry Birds on my iPhone is an app. How many people use apps on a daily basis? About half, that's kind of awesome. Uh, what's a mobile site? Uh, it's basically, it's a website, right? Only it's been kind of reformatted to be interpreted um, by mobile browsers in, a, in the same way that they interpret websites, but with different information, maybe. Maybe um, highlighting different and uh, use, more useful information. How's, how's mobile different? Well, we've got the smaller screen, we've got the touch controls. These things can do more, more than one thing at a time. We can be getting email while we're checking the web. We can be getting email while we're making a phone call. We can be texting and, and making phone calls at the same time. Um, but the big one is that shift in connectivity. <coughs> we're not actually, we're not tied to the wall. And we're not tied to a vehicle. Like that was the first evolution, like being able to like being mobile was like, my car is now internet enabled or I can make a phone call from my car. And that was pretty mobile. But now it's, it's 
that, that shift in connectivity has gone all the way to, it's in my pocket, it's always there when I need it. And that's the, that's the kind of key defining factor in mobile. Like I said, it's always on, it's always on us. If we need some quick, like, quick access to information, we can just pull out our iPhone and check it. Um, like I said, all arguments with my wife. Um, and I remember, I remember ten, five, six years ago, you know, me and my wife on a road trip and we get into argument about some fact. I would call somebody, hey, will you look this up? Like, how many people called and said like, hey, will you look this up for me? Like, this address, whatever it is, I need it, can you look it up for me? No more. Now, if we're arguing in the car, and, and she's usually right, but um, when I happen to be right, I can, I can get that through my iPhone or through my mobile phone. Um, most of the time, when we're using these devices now, like, they kind of get our attention, and they can be kind of omnipresent and, and grab our attention when we need, when we need it. Uh, so if we get an email, there's a ding, and I know that I got an email, and I can check it. Um, anybody play Tiny Tower? No, it's a game. It's a game for iOS. It's, it's kind of like a macroeconomic game. Um, and you build floors, and you restock all of these um, stores. And so like Tiny Towers will go off every once in a while and be like, oh, your planetarium needs restocked. And I'll go in and restock my planetarium. But it got my attention, and I, and I tended to it. Um, and just kind of the nature of people now, we're, we're frequently interrupted. And that's like mobile just kind of stepped in and went like, OK, if you're frequently interrupted, like, let's be useful. Let's be, let's, let's be productive about it. And that's, that's a huge benefit for mobile. Any questions about that kind of section? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and the need for practical stuff that does stuff. Yep. My son the other day watched a Mentos commercial with a spider that throws him around and says, go to Mentos and download the spider. So he plays this Mentos spider, spider fighting game. Yeah. The question is, it doesn't really have any value. It's just a novelty act. So is there a per point at which you become big enough that you use apps just for branding purposes? Right, if you get... So the question is, if, like, is there a tipping point where... Um, kind of pointless apps all, like, can become not pointless? And the answer is yes. It's, you know, the internet is a, is a thing of scale. And so if, if your brand, like Mentos, is everywhere, and you need ways of connecting with consumers, and you're Mentos, right? You're, you're still Mentos. Having an app that locates where you can go buy Mentos isn't very useful. It's not a good way to get in front of customers. But having something that's quirky and fun and um, that you might play a few times and just kind of enforce brand awareness, yeah, then, then it could be worth it. Because some of these big brands will spend, you know, what's a Super Bowl commercial? 2.5 million? That's just to run it. That's not even to make the darn thing, right? 2.5 million for 30 seconds on the Super Bowl. You can build an app and, you know, for how you can build a. <laughs> Key takeaway today, you can build an app for half of that. Yeah. Hey, Dan, you mentioned that you showed the, the different platforms, and I'm curious about like, your, your presentation, relative market share, and then are, are people beginning to see Android people have a certain demographic versus you know, iPhone? Those are, you know, I almost went through and like added all these awesome stats, but I was like, they're going to be obsolete tomorrow. So I didn't. Um, there's a lot of sites on the internet that you can get all those stats, and those stats are constantly changing. And so I'll talk about it in a little while, but, and that's kind of a, a broad swath of, of, I don't know, sample size or sample. So it's not always the most represent most representative of, of the folks that are coming to your business. If you're in local, if you're in rural Iowa, like my dad just got a smartphone, um, just barely, right? And, uh, but you know, six months ago he was just using a feature phone. And so things like SMS and whatnot would have been a lot more valuable for any business out in rural Iowa to do than a full-blown app or um, 
whatnot. Like e no matter how you slice the demographics, you still got to look at who you, who your customers are and, and what they're using, because it might be different than the national trend. Um, quick note: value for value in mobile, it's not always cash, right? Like, there's examples of fart apps that make a ton of money, but there's not a whole lot of value in it, especially if you're a business owner, right? Like, you can float your business the next year, but you didn't gain any um, brand awareness or loyalty through a fart app. So just it's kind of a side note, you know, value does not equal straight up cash in this equation. And this is a long process, right? Mobile just got here, it's not going away. So I want to talk about where you'll find value, where you won't find value, ways to build that, right? And the premise is kind of like you have to do mobile. And uh, that might be wrong, right? Because I would probably venture to guess that 99% of you are already doing mobile in some way. You just might not realize it. And like I said, this has been a long time coming. <coughs> the Newton, right? The Newton started in 1987, and that's 25 years ago. 25 years ago. And they kept it around for a decade. They spent almost $100 million on trying to make this Newton. And then they finally killed it in 1998. Um, and it didn't work. It was terrible. Like, it didn't work, and, and I think, you know, things like GPS and, and, and the internet everywhere are kind of the reasons, I mean, PDAs were huge for a long time too, but nobody, really, everyone wanted a PDA, but how many people like sat down and did like hardcore stuff with their PDA? Nobody, it was kind of like a trendy thing. It wasn't actually useful. But now with the internet, now with um, all of these new capabilities on these mobile phones, now you can do really interesting things with them that you couldn't before. Um, well, you'll find value, right? If I gave you a choice, hey, Christian, I know you're going on a road trip and you're going to California. I've got this stack of maps. I've got this atlas for you. Um, or here's a, here's a GPS-enabled smartphone, mobile phone. What are you going to take? There you go. Given enough large, given a, a large enough sample size, <laughs> I'm going to venture to guess that everyone would pick the second option almost every time. So, yeah, you kind of got to you got to do mobile, or you're already doing it, um, really. And things you know you won't find value, right? These fart apps. I mean that's. It's trendy, maybe. It was trendy, you know, two years ago. Um, and some of them made, some of them made money, right? But they were out of business pretty quick. And uh, I, I want my business to have more than like a three month shelf life. How about you? But where you will find value, right? This is cheesy, right? It's user success. Um, if, if, you own a local pizza place and I'm trying to order a pizza from you. Um, it doesn't matter how many pictures of a pizza you're going to show me. If I can't find your phone number, if I can't find your address, uh, you're going to fail because I'm going to look at your pictures and then I'm going to go to Domino's because I know that they'll give me a phone number that I can call and then they'll deliver it. So it's all based on your user, right? Like when you're doing web, it's really easy to kind of do the me too because there's plenty of space. There's there's plenty of time. There's you can you can throw so much information out there, um, like full blown desktop websites, right? Um, you can throw so much information out there that something will be valuable to them. Um, but when you're in a mobile context, you don't have all that real estate. You have to pick and choose. You've got to find and think about what your users actually are going to be looking at. I say users, you say customers. Um, customers, oh, we've got customers too. Um, how do we build that value? Right, we focus on utility. We give them that phone number when they want that phone number. We give them an email address. We give, a, give them the hours that, the, that we're open. 
So if, we're, if they're bordering around an edge case, it's 9 o'clock, and they, they're like, I don't remember if they're still open, we can look it up and see if they actually are. We want to reduce complex, like complexity. We, we as, as business owners, as people that are putting out mobile things, want to go, you know, like that directory of, of, of services that I have, well, if they can't find me, maybe I should prioritize a phone number over it. Or maybe I should prioritize like some written directions of how to get to our office. Or maybe I should tell them why they should care about us. Um, the, all, the other thing is like, do things for me, right? In, in, when you're building like mobile sites, things like that, um, there's really small details, right? Like we can take a phone number and we can just show it as a number. Or we can take that phone number and give the browser or give, give an app a tip that, hey, that's an actual phone number and if you click it, it will just go straight and call that place. Instead of having to copy and pay, like copy it and then go to your, you know, to the phone app and then paste the number in and then call it. Um, do things for your users. Don't make them, don't make them work. They're, they're obviously trying to find you. Um, they're obviously trying to interact with you. Don't make it harder than it needs to be. Like I just said, increase accessibility. So it's, it's, it's making sure that all of these small things that you want the, the users to do is, are actually um, done in the easiest way possible for them, not the easiest way possible for you. And there's a lot of times in, in doing mobile that um, there's actually extra work on you to make that happen. So I talked about all those three. So I want to talk now kind of about how to be mobile, right? Mobile's everywhere. If you think about it, Billboard's kind of mobile. Like there's all these mediums and all these messages and they're, they're getting put everywhere. And um, that's, it's, it's everywhere. Um, mobile is so much bigger than apps and, and websites. It's, um, you've got your native apps, you've got your native sites, that's great. Um, but there's still other ways, right? With a native app, you've got some piece of native code that runs on one platform, and I can do like one thing, right? I can find where the Tron movie is. I can also do things like build my own app for a couple hundred bucks. And that's a way to be mobile. We have, we have the folks from Mo, Mojava, Mojava, Mojava? I always wanna say Mojava, um, but it's Mojava. Um, they're building a, a platform, or they're building a solution for um, agencies, advertising agencies that, that are working with their clients. And they're, what they want to do is build out a mobile site that can be consumed by any phone. And so you, you talk to an agency, the agency is using Mojava, and the, the agency can basically build you a site that it doesn't matter if they're using a feature phone or if they're using the, the smartest, like the latest smartphone, they can um, kind of reformat and dynamically output um, sites that will be perfectly tailored to the phone that your user is uh, using. And so they're doing a lot of the um, do the work for the user for you. Just a caveat, you've got to remember what people want. I don't want to have to drive to your store to see what your hours are. And in a sense, this is, this is kind of mobile, but it's kind of hard to use because I can't do it from my house. This is where I think most people fall into they're already doing mobile, which is you've got social networking sites set up, you've got a Facebook page, and you've got your hours on there. And so make sure you keep them up to date. Um, but I think for the most part, when I go, if like a cursory Google search doesn't show me the information I want, I go to Facebook and I'll look up Smoky Row or Mars Cafe if they don't have, you know, if they don't have their hours easily um, accessible through Google. Like this is a spot I always try. And this is where I think most people end up actually being mobile. That or newsletters. If you're sending out email newsletters to your folks, like we said, we're getting email on our mobile phones. A lot of the time, the first stop for an email that I read is on my mobile phone. So if you're doing newsletters, I'm guessing, I'm not guessing, you're already doing mobile. Making sure that those things look great in a mobile format. 
I'll talk about how you do that in a little bit. Um, another great way, piggyback on other apps, right? Like Flipboard. Flipboard is this beautiful RSS reader, hooks into Google Reader, and it will take pictures from an article and kind of display them. And so your blog, your website, whatnot, can be viewed next to a bunch of other people's websites with your beautiful photography, with your beautiful content, with your brilliant words. And uh, they, 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 being Flipboard, trying to make it beautiful. Um, and there's so many other piggyback apps. You know, social networks could be called a piggyback app where your information lives inside of another app. But just a, another way of being mobile without spending a dollar. Google Maps. I get really, in, like, we've, I've moved headquarters. And uh, first thing we did was, like, go into Google Maps and make sure that it had our new address. Because, you know, for as much, like, we take it for granted that, oh, people will come to my site. That's where I keep my, my address and, and phone number up to date. But it's not. I go straight to Google. Um, and the great thing about Google is if I'm going somewhere to no Omaha, I can actually just print that out and bring it with me um, or do the turn by turn on the phone. But if I don't have my business's information in the Google, that's not possible. It's just, unless I actually find the address, go back, copy and paste it into Google, and you know, we're back to not doing the work for our users. So I've got a few things to get started. If uh, you read the register and saw my beautiful picture, um, thank you. Thanks for laughing, Christian. Um, you've kind of seen these, but I'll explain them. All right, do your homework, audit what you're doing, tackle the low-hanging fruit, think long-term, and observe. Um, right, this is a good spot to start. So how do you do your homework? Talk to your customers. Ask them what they're using. Like, ask them what phones they are, they're doing. Um, ask them how they found you. Ask them if they found you through the, your Facebook page or if they went through Google Maps or ask them if they actually like, looked up your website, went there, found your phone number. Um, ask them what they're looking for. Like, what, what are the most interesting pieces of your business that they're looking for? Is it just hours or is it what your product or service is? Or are they looking up uh, information like this event so they can go and get here um, on the right day, right? Because it's about what they want, not necessarily what you want, if you really want to reach them. And while you have your customer's phone, look yourself up, right? Ask your friends. Grab every phone that's around you. Grab your friend's iPad, anything that's mobile. Grab it, look yourself up, see if it works. See if you can click on your phone number, see if you can just call yourself. Um, there's so many times where like these basics are just not covered. And uh, it doesn't have to be that hard. You don't actually have to spend very much money to be completely mobile enabled without being mobile enabled. Right? Tackle your low hanging fruit. Figure out where you want to be and be there and keep it up to date. Make sure your address is correct in Google Maps so um, people don't go to the wrong spot. There was a time, a couple, oh, like a year ago, I went to meet with this guy and I looked up his business on Google Maps, and uh, it had, it, it took me to this, um, like this P.O. box and this, or this suite in this one place. And uh, I just put, like I had a copy and paste and I put it in Google Maps. And I get there and it's like Kinko's, right? And I'm like, sweet, I'm at Kinko's. This is obviously not your, like, your office. Why did you put your office into Google Maps as this Kinko's? Needless to say, like, it took me another week before I met with the guy. It was just, it was ridiculous. As a user, I mean, I wasn't a user, but as a potential customer, I was just not happy. Facebook pages, right? This is another spot. Foursquare. Yelp, if, you, if, if it's Yelp where people are finding you, make sure that information is up to date. Right? And think long term. like. People, like I showed you before, 1987, people have been working on mobile a long time. And they're trying to find value. 
um, and it's not going away. Like it's just going to be more pervasive, right? The internet's just always going to be our, in our pocket now. The only next step we can do is put the internet in our brain, which would be awesome. <laughs> But think about for your business, ask your customers, where's that, like, where's that long-term value lie? Like, what can I start building now that might take me a couple years, um, but when I get there, I'm gonna have the most useful, um, for my customers, mobile experience possible. Um, one caveat, like, don't get caught in the mobile land rush. Uh, talk to your friends, ask them about when the web came of age. Right? Everybody wanted to sell them a $100 website. And then they bought into it. And then 10 years later, they have the $100 website that they all hate, their customers hate, and they've just, there's like this inertial fortitude that they can't overcome. Like they're just like, but we already did it. Uh, we didn't do it well. I just, I kind of give up on the web. Don't do that. Think about it and then do something. Also, just keep your eyes open and observe. Like what are your customers using now? What are they starting to use that they weren't using yesterday? Um, watch tech news. You don't have to be a techie, but just watch it. Like, hear what other people are saying. Is, this, is there a new Facebook feature that all of a sudden is amazing and that you should be doing? Um, should you be ditching Twitter for Google Plus? No. Um, but it's a question that you need to ask yourself, right? Be gorilla about it. And you don't have to be everywhere, right? If, if, if Yelp is perfect for your business, then stop pinning stuff on Pinterest and get back to Yelp and you know, curate that information. So those are my five tips. Um, any questions you guys have? I'll take them now. Yeah. For having for having mobile apps? Um, the biggest hurdle is that right now is cost, right? To do something well, it costs, a, it costs a good chunk of change. And uh, until you find that distribution, it's, until you find that scale, until you have a lot of customers, um, it's kind of going to be relegated to not Super Bowl ad status, but Super Bowl ad status, right? Like, you've, you've got to make sure that that is going to fit your need, and then, you can, then, then go for it. Why do you think there's a why do you think there's such a disparity between the two? Oh, okay. So the question is, why is there a price disparity between website development and mobile development? There, in in certain ways, there's not right. Um, both web development and app development is kind of like going and looking for a car, going to dealerships. Um, you can buy the Fiat, not Fiat. Fiat's all right. I don't know. It's foreign. <laughs> You could buy the Yugo, there we go, that's better. You can buy a Yugo um, from the Yugo dealership or you can go buy a Mercedes or you could find something in between. And uh, that, that perception and quality that you have towards it is the same perception and quality that your customers are gonna have towards it. And there's, there's places around town, right? Like there's the Killer Deli B&B, like best killer sandwiches ever, right? They could buy a Yugo, their customers don't like, it goes with their aesthetic, right? Like, and it would be completely fine, and people would not balk at it. Um, but if, you're, if all the other assets of your, or facades of your business look like a Mercedes, then you need to go to a Mercedes dealer and get a site, there, site or app built there, right? There's site makers that are $100,000 plus, right? The best in the industry, Happy Cog, on their little art, like, form where you start to fill out a project planner for them. The first line is like, is your project over $100,000? Because that's where we start. And it's not a reflection on anybody, except for that's, that's the dealership you walked into and you need to know that. Does that answer your question? I know. Yeah. So for people who are not up to date, maybe your dad would be the person I would describe. Who, how does somebody like that find out about Mm -hmm. say, hey, check this out. Uh, so the, the question is like, how do people like my dad find useful apps? And uh, 
Right now, it's by happenstance. So if I was trying to target or market towards my dad, I would not build an app. I would not build a mobile site. Like he does everything on. I would make sure that my Google Places was up to date for him. I make sure my Yahoo Places, whatever you know, this public information that about my business is up to date because that's where he's looking. He's not savvy enough right now to to figure it out. Sometimes he is, but it's, it's completely happenstance. Yeah. What criteria? Do you I think it's, so the question is, how do you, how do you know what criteria, criteria it, what are the criteria to know whether you should build a mobile site or an app? Yeah, um, I would make sure that your mobile site or your site looks good on, on mobile in, in the first place. Um, and then you've got to talk to your customers. You've got to find, like, what's your reach? What's your audience? What's your demographic? What are those people using? Are they using apps? Because if they are, maybe it could be. Maybe that uh, barrier to entry just went down a lot because you've got 5,000 rabid fans versus um, that, that want an app for you versus um, you know, 10,000 people that are kind of ambivalent, right? 10,000 my dads versus 5,000 rabid fans. The numbers are, you know, the scales are like this, but I would totally might build an app over here. Yeah. Um, as a consumer of apps, you know, some are on my phone, they disappear immediately, some stay on a while, some stay on longer term. The one that's always surprised me like you guys worked on is app for a gas station. Can you talk a little bit more about the creative process of that? For, and also for come did, and go? Yeah, but what also you didn't do. Oh, yeah. So, uh, like, for come and go, um, the question is, like, what was the thought process behind the come and go app? Kind of, right? Yeah. Okay, so come and go came out with this new campaign, and uh, it was targeted at 25 to 34 year olds, um, like, younger demographic, and they featured these cute characters, warm and fuzzy. And, uh, and they, were, they were putting ads on, like, Adult Swim, right? They were running ads on, I don't know, um, Pandora, um, they were trying to find these people where they were at, and one of the places that these young folks are at are in the app store. And so uh, they came to us and said, hey, will you build an app in the app store? We've only got, in their case, it was like a couple weeks. We've only got a couple weeks. Let's do this. And so we said, sure, great. We took basically complete you know, creative control and just like went down our rabbit tubes and said, all right, we've got two and a half weeks to build an iPhone and Android version, what are we gonna do? Um, how can we extract the most value? How can we find something that is fun? How can we make something that like, can spread, right? Because we, we know that they're not gonna have five million customers come and download this app. So how can we take the ones that do and kind of get that out there um, on its own? And so we built this, the photo sharing feature, right? You, you take, um, these photo frames with the cute characters and you can kind of pose yourself differently and there's these coupons that every two weeks there's a different coupon and to unlock it you've got to take a photo and share it. And you also, um, you can take a photo and share it or you can enter your email address to subscribe to their newsletter, right? We want to capture you or we want you to share it with your friends. And so that ended up being our, our thought process. How do we take the people that are going to come in how do we convert them some way, maybe multiple times, you know, every two weeks gives them a, um, a reason to keep coming back. Uh, and we also put some new photo frames in halfway through. Okay. What, what was on the cutting room floor? What did somebody want to do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, lots of stuff. <laughs> I mean, like, we go through some of that stuff like it's toilet paper, right? Like. We've got so many ideas, and if they're not good, we just flush them because they're not. Uh, like we're just looking for the ones that stick. We just go and we go and we brainstorm, and as we like, we'll have ones that we keep coming back to, and then we know that there's something there. And then the next day, if we talked about that one that we've talked about a couple times before, then we're like, oh, maybe we should do that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Back to Christian's question. The other reason why. Um, apps a lot of times cost a lot more than a website. It's because there's a lot more um, thought capital put into it up front. Because we've really got to go down and figure out, like, 
Most people are coming to us with a full website. We've got to go through and figure out what is important to their users. And, uh, and it's not usually an exercise that they've done. Because when they built the website, they came out with that big knife. And uh, you can actually get away with a big knife, like the big multi-tool knife on a website. Um, and people can still find what they want. It's very easy to just filter out the stuff that you don't want on a desktop web experience. Yeah. Is, are there, as a, yeah, okay, so the question is, are there ways of being platform agnostic while you're trying to think and build about an app? What we do is we break everything down into workflows. And uh, the workflows are, are what feeds into our wireframes, which are um, platform specific. But we, f we break down all the screens into, basically, if you were to look at our, an output of our wireframes, we have a wireframe, and we'll have like a couple sentences about what the app, or what that screen does, and then we'll have the data pieces on that screen, right? Like any dynamic data pieces, like it's going to have their first name and their last name and their firstborn's name, um, and then actions at the bottom, where that's going to take us to. And so, though the right side is workflow information, the the left side is kind of how we just laid it out the first time in a in a sketchy wireframe sort of way and see if it works. Um, and so then we'll just match up workflows with wireframes so we feel we got it right, then we'll go on to mockups. Um, and then there's some times where we have to wait till mockups to do something really well <coughs> if it just doesn't, if it's still not feeling right. Yeah, Mike, how are we doing? Okay. Do you know Is there any market feedback about what people are searching for in app stores? No. Um, we don't get what keywords people typed in to, to get our apps. I wish, I mean, it would be amazing, right, if they provided us like the Google Analytics of, of how people found our apps, but they don't. They don't at all. And so we just will experiment a little bit, try different keywords. Um, and, but it's, yeah, it's kind of a, not a dark art, just a guess, guessing game. Go ahead. Do you find yourself applying more game logic, game, game theory when you're doing your app development? I know in my company, more and more clients want to engage, like you said, kind of the, either you get points, you get coupons, some sort of a reward system while still keeping them engaged and uh, wanting mm -hmm. to come back and use your app over and over and over. Yeah, okay, so the question is, um, do we employ any game theory, game mechanics, whatnot, when we're building apps? Absolutely. Um, the great thing about mobile is most of the time it's very personal, right? You never go up to somebody and go, hey, can I borrow your phone to make a phone call? Um, or can I, like, I want to download, I need to try this new app, Matt. Can I just have your phone? I just want to, yeah, you're not, it's not going to happen. It's very personalized. And so how do we build those, like, we think about how we build those connections with the users. Um, how can we put out signposts saying, like, hey, you know, come and unlock this coupon now and it's good through two weeks and then you need to come back and unlock it or share it. You know, we have to make it very clear how, how these things work and how they unlock and, and what plays into each other. Um, I'm trying to think of the different apps that we've done, see if there's any, like with, it's also kind of how we, no, that's the best example. Yeah, we think about it. Sometimes it's not always applicable, but we definitely think about it. Any other questions? You, yeah. You talked earlier about you know how would dad find the app. So a company decides to go the app development route. Mm -hmm. um, getting the word out, disseminating the information, making your app findable yeah. in the different types of stores. Can you talk about how you you uh, or your clients have marketed apps successfully, the types of techniques that are employed to help make your app findable? Yeah. Um, what are the what are some tips, techniques for making your app findable if it's done and you've got, like, what marketing support do you put behind it? Um, for the Come and Go app, they were launching a full-blown winter campaign. And so the things that they were doing, they, they sent out an email newsletter blast to all of their subscribers saying, hey, 
go check out this app. And not even just go check out this app. This is what the app does. Here's how it could benefit you. You know, give it a shot. You know, it, it, it's the same newsletter that um, they'll send coupons in. So they're like, hey, we've got coupons. They're just locked up in this app. Go check it out. Um, we think it's fun for you. They also were putting door clings on the front of come and go stores. They were putting, um, it was a coffee promotion, right? It was about their Java Ridge coffee, really, and their Toys for Tots. So they were putting clings on the coffee machines, um, saying like, for more information about the Java Ridge coffee, um, or to, you know, the, they, were, they were touting the benefits of why they should go and get the app at the different points of, of customer interaction that they actually had themselves. I don't think they ran any commercials or any audio bits or anything like that for the app, but it was all very experiential marketing for it. You know, like I'm here, I'm getting a coffee, there's something that tells me to go get it. Or through the coupon newsletter, it's telling me, me that there's more coupons over here. So they're exploiting their built-in channels and how they were interacting with customers. I'm going to yeah. go. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. The question is, um, like, what's the big difference between maybe a, a static app versus um, something that's dynamic? And uh, the big thing is personalization, right? Like, how 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 does how do we make this customer feel like they're it's connected to this app or connected to this event? For eighty thirty five, eighty thirty five for all intensive purposes, static app, right? It's completely static. There's little dynamic pieces, but the one interact like when we had one interaction, there was only one interaction, but it was everywhere, which was you could star your bands, and so we had all of these static pages, you know, with the band information, where they're playing, whatnot, and we had this one concept, this one way of interacting with the app, and we we copied it everywhere, and what that did for our backend systems was made it very easy. We had one action to take care of. We're saving like this band that they want to know about. And we gave them a million different ways to do it. And people really loved it. Like, you just went in and you started your stuff. And it was really easy for us to do. It was really easy for us to kick out the app in general because we were just displaying static content for the most part. You know, we were taking it in from their existing WordPress site, slightly massaging it, and putting it back out. Um, and so there's ways, right? The worst thing on mobile apps, for the most part, are forms. Like, if you're entering a bunch of information, that's, that's, it's hard to do extremely well. But you can have small little interactions that, that make people fall in love, be attached to, whatever words you want to use, um, to an app. And it doesn't have to be extravagant. It doesn't have to be extreme. It can be very, very simple. Saving your favorites. You had a question. That leads into my question. What's the deciding factor of either building a mobile-friendly site or a site that's optimized for mobile or going off to an internet? Yeah, so the question is, like, um, how do you decide between going uh, native or getting a mobile site done? Um, it's going to be your user, right? It's going to be your, your user. It's going to be how much um, reach you've got. It's going to be what types of things do, the, do you want to do um, and uh, what are, what's the best medium for them. Um, if you want something that's highly interactive and um, plays m like, a, like a game, well, maybe, maybe an app is, is right for you. But if you just want some static information um, with a little bit of um, interactivity, like the 835 app, we could have done that as a mobile site. It would have been still pretty easy to do. Um, but people just wanted to pull it up. They wanted to have their stuff cached. There was some, you know, they wanted to we didn't know what kind of network connectivity there was going to be at the festival. You know, you got 15,000 people all on top, of, on top of each other. Sometimes the towers die, so you need to be able to do it all offline. Um, so it's going to be really just listening to what your customers want, listening to your, your 
voice, like what, what am I trying to build, not for tomorrow, but for the next few years, and seeing where those intersect at. And you, uh, you know, regardless of, you need to make sure that your site just looks good in a mobile browser, right? Just that you can pull it up, you can find the information that you need. Some people don't need to make full-blown you know, uh, mobile sites to get that done. <coughs> Wait a bit in the back. The Apple Human Interface Guidelines. Um, they put out a whole book on it, and uh, not book. It's a guide. It's a free PDF, but it's it's thorough. It's intensive. It, it shows you the thinking behind it. Um, some of the other oh bonus material learning. I knew this question was going to come up. Right, if you need some sites to go and like keep your ear to the ground, these are good sites. These slides will be up online so you don't have to write them down. Um, books, these are the three that you're after, maybe. Um, don't Make Me Think, which is all from the user's perspective, like how, how can you build things for users and make them not go crazy. Um, this is my favorite book of all time, really, seriously. Uh, the Paradox of Choice by Barry Schwartz. And uh, his, whole, his whole book is about how choice is kind of like the bane of everybody's existence and how um, companies will make consumers, make their users, make their customers, make these inane choices on a day-to-day -day basis that, that actually hurts them more than helps them. And, and the, kind of the best example out of that book um, for this audience is that they, these people went to the mall and set up a cupcake stand. And, um, and there's like 35 different varieties of cupcakes that they were trying to sell consumers. And in one, on one day, they, they set up all 35 kinds of the cupcakes. So you could come up and you could take that strawberry watermelon one that you're kind of curious about, you could try it. Um, and then on another day, you could just sample three. It was like vanilla, chocolate, whatever, hazelnut. The one that you could sample anything that you wanted sold poorly, terrible, nobody bought. I think there was about, I don't remember the actual <coughs> stats, but I think it was like three times as many cupcakes went out the door than with the three choices, but only a third of the sales. Why? Because you were paralyzing your user with choice. Oh, well, the one I really want to try is this strawberry watermelon. I'm going to try it. I've, I've experienced it now. I don't need to buy it. And they just move on. So I, I highly recommend. The last one is, kind of, is called Rework. It's just a way of looking at your business differently. And uh, you need some events. Here's some events to go to. But we done? We are. Awesome. We'll wrap it up. Hey, thank you very much. Yeah.